Hi, I'm excited to share that we have a new free bonus just for you. We've started publishing our very own quarterly cyber risk management journal. It's loaded with over 30 pages of useful content taken directly from our podcast. Here's how we make each new edition. So we start by transcribing the four or five episodes that we've published in the previous three months. Next, we send our editor and designer the transcripts and our supporting materials for those episodes. Then they revise all the text, they put clickable links in for all the resources, and they create the best look and feel for each episode. And finally, we, Kip and I, make sure the finished PDF is ready for you. So download the current edition now. All you have to do is go to b.link forward slash C-R-M-J, that's the letter B, dot L-I-N-K forward slash C-R-M-J. And if you like it, share it with your friends and encourage them to subscribe to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help you thrive as a cyber risk manager. On today's episode, your virtual chief information security officer is Kip Boyle, and your virtual cybersecurity counsel is Jake Bernstein. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. So, Kip, what are we going to talk about today? Hey there, Jake. Well, I recently got asked this question. Um, about a, about how to pass a CISSP exam. And I get that question periodically. It's, it's a perennial favorite. So I thought we should probably talk about that. And then in the future, when somebody asks me, I can just say, well, there's a podcast episode about that. Uh, I, we can do that. You know, it turns out we've both passed our CISSP exam. So let's share what we know. Um, but, but first... I feel that we should um, we should discuss something cr- truly important about this exam. All right, that is the appropriate pronunciation of CISSP. <laughs> Does it need a pronunciation? <laughs> so I recently referred to it as the CISP, and I got yelled at by um, someone who's who's very well known in our our industry group, uh, Jean Pollock. Shout out to Jean if she happens to listen to this episode. She scolded me and said that it is CISSP and it shall not be called CISP. Um, however, I was not the one who started the CISP uh, <laughs> at who I heard that from. But if I slip into calling it CISP, um, alternately, I either apologize or do not, depending upon your preferred pronunciation. <laughs> well, I'm going to keep tally marks and I'm going to report you to Gene. God bless Gene. <laughs> Isn't that so funny? Because I was just saying that. I'm like, why does it need a pronunciation? <laughs> well, so I guess full disclosure mode, you, you're you actually, um, you're an officer, right? In the local chapter of ISC Squared. That's Are a, you not? And in fact, this is the perfect episode to um, pitch membership in the local ISC Squared Seattle chapter. It is brand new. This episode is being recorded in late January 2021, and the the group received its uh, certification from ISC Squared within the last week. So uh, this won't air for quite some time. Hopefully, by the time mid March, yeah, by the time this episode is is sent out for everyone to consume, we'll have had a good couple of meetings and be established as a chapter. But uh, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, we will, you know, we take. We're certainly interested in having people join who aren't yet CISSPs. I didn't uh, know you could do that. That's good. Well, That's good to know. You can be an associate member, which means <clears throat> you can get help actually becoming a CISSP. So this is not merely um, pitching membership in a fun little club. It is directly applicable to actually passing your CISSP exam. So now that we've said CISSP slash CISP so many times, uh, let's... Uh, let's just make sure people know what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah what is ACISSP? So it stands for Certified Information Systems Security Professional. And as I've been mentioning, it is um, a certification from ISC Squared. Uh, you know, I don't actually know what ISC Squared stands for. but Well, I can tell you, um, ISC Squared, um, you ready for it? I mean, there's a reason why there is a two. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason why they squared it. Okay, here we go. It's the International 
Information Systems Security Certification Consortium. My God, what a mouthful. Wow. Okay. So that does explain the, it's actually a, it's actually ISC in parentheses and the whole kind of concept is squared. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's mathematically correct, but it's fun. It could be, you know, (laughs) it is mathematically correct because although I don't think it would expand as a binomial properly. Anyway, (laughs) wow. Um, I'm so sorry, everybody. I took us into math. (laughs) We haven't recorded in a while. Um, uh, Kip, we're all very happy that you recovered successfully from COVID-19. Oh, my God. Um, So uh, now that that's out of the way, Let's actually go ahead and move into content that people want to hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and by the way, COVID-19 is a sneaky little bugger of a virus. I don't recommend it. Um, I didn't have to see a doctor. I didn't have to go to the hospital, which was wonderful. Um, for a person my age, um, I feel like I got off easy, even though I couldn't work for over two weeks. It was just... Well, we're all glad that you are no longer as miserable. Yeah, thank you. So, okay. So so one thing that I want to get out of the way right away is I, I think there's there's many different types of certifications out there. You know, one could say, you know, uh, and there's a difference between certifications and degrees. So for example, you know, someone with a PhD or a JD, um, that indicates that you have simply completed a certain amount of education and graduated. A certification is something different. And the important thing to understand about the CISSP is that it is not an entry-level certification. I think a lot of people are confused about that. And one of the things that I get asked sometimes is, well, should I go get a CISSP in order to get into the industry? And the answer is, it doesn't really work that way, does it, Kip? No, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, it's um, it's and it's not their fault. I mean, I, that, that people would think that because a lot of job descriptions uh, kind of imply that it's an entry level certification, and so um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. But but you're but you're right. It is not an entry level certification, and anybody who tries to sort of cram it into an entry level situation that they find themselves in, really, I think you're just making your life way more difficult than it needs to be. Um, I would redirect you to a, you know, security plus, uh, you know, certification. There, there are others that I think would be much, much better suited while you accumulate the five minimum five years of direct full-time security work experience in two or more of the information security domains and the common body of knowledge. So, I mean, it five years, okay? So, um, and the test kind of, I think, reflects reflects that, right? I mean, um, so, so I'm glad we got a chance to dispel that. Now, you can get one year of the five years waived by having a bachelor's degree. And there's a couple of other, like, little things you can do to get a year shaved off, but it, that doesn't change the fact that this is not entry level. No, it's it's not entry level at all. And and talking about, you know, the test, I think will kind of indicate that. So um the current the modern version, and and Kip can give ancient <laughs> ancient Paleolithic history on the exam. Um it's a I knew multiple, that was meant for me. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. It's a it's a multiple choice exam. Uh you have up to three hours and we'll get up to 150 questions. It is a computer adaptive exam or computer adaptive test. Um, I don't know. So what it means is that the, the test is actually run by algorithms. And as you answer questions, the more you get right, the harder the questions will become. And unlike a traditional test, a comp- an adaptive exam seeks to actually uh, have you get about fifty percent wrong, which would be an you know that's an F by ten percent. That's an F, right? Um, under the kind of old standards of of evaluation, but but scientists and mathematicians and and other experts tell us that computer adaptive exams are actually better at evaluating expertise than traditional exams. So. Um, I believe it's a minimum of, um, of 100 questions. So basically, there's about 50 questions, about 50%, actually, you may or may not see. Uh, there is a scaled score of 700 points or greater out of 1,000 possible points. Um, I think 700 is what it takes to pass. 
uh, but it's not it's not like it's a f- it, there's not a direct correlation like i said this is all algorithms and you actually have to achieve a passing score in all eight knowledge domains um right so you could be really strong in seven bomb the eighth and you're not getting out you're of not there getting it no. um the fee is 700 dollars to take the test i think that's up a little bit from when i took it a few years ago uh the renewal is honestly pretty minimal at 125 per year and um uh, one thing to point out about the CISSP is that it actually reminds me a lot of of having a bar number because you have to have CPEs, which are uh, continuing professional education credits. Uh, I'm used to thinking of them as CLEs. If I accidentally say C, if I accidentally say CLE, I apologize. I mean CPE, but it's continuing ed like many other forms of professional. Well, <clears throat> you're uh, kind of a professional student, then, aren't you? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, in, uh, aren't we all in some way? Well, if you're in this career field, you certainly should you be. You certainly are. So the uh, the CPE requirement is actually pretty high. It's 40 credit hours per year over in a... Um, and then times three, you're reporting... What I consider it to be your reporting period is three years. So every three years, you have to have finished 120 CPEs. Um, interestingly enough, my law, my law license only requires 45 over three years. So... <laughs> Uh, I was wondering about that. Well, and I, I think it's, I will say that the standards for what a CLE credit is are a lot higher and more strict than than a CPE. And the CPE is all self-reported, um, though it can be audited, whereas CLE is is managed by the State Bar Association. So they're similar, but I don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make the mistake of thinking that, oh, you know. It's not one for one. It's not one for one. And I would not call the the 40 CPEs you know, three times harder to get than the than the than the CLEs that the fifteen per year CLE credits that you need as a lawyer. Um, well, so, I think it I think it reflects just the pace of change. I think that's one thing that you're seeing there, right? Is that the pace of change in each of the disciplines is a little different? Yeah. So so let's you know let's maybe talk a little bit about uh, before we get before we dive more into the test. Let's talk about what the CISSP means and why you might want it. Uh, it's a, I, my impression is that it is, it is considered the kind of top level security related certification for managerial and leadership positions. It is, I think it's important to say what it is not. It is not a hacker certificate. It is not, um, it, you have to know a lot of technical detail, but it is not a technical exam. Um, or I should say the certification is not a technical certification. Someone with a CISSP is probably not going to be personally programming firewall rules. Um, you could. They might, but they it's might. not. But they don't correlate directly. They don't correlate directly. This and this is not like an A plus certification or a CEH or any of the other many, many, many OSCP. certifications. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Cisco certs, whatever. I mean, there's um, there's lots of really technical ones. This is not really technical. No, it really isn't. And and it is it, it the another thing that makes it very similar to a law license is that it comes with its own um, ethical code, which I think is great. I think it's actually a really important part of it. I think it's one of the reasons that ISC squared has really established itself and maintained its hold on what this certification means. So, you know, you when you become a lawyer and get sworn into the bar, you take an oath uh, on, you know, the constitution, et cetera. Uh, it's not quite that, that, um, well, you become an officer of the court, don't you? You do. Yes, you do. And, and I learned that on by watching, um, better call Saul, by the way, isn't that terrible? Go. Yeah, that is kind of <laughs> terrible. <laughs> anyway, um, though you do not become an officer of the court with CISSP, I do believe that, uh, you do enter a profession and where there are ethical responsibilities. So, um, it's a lot more than just one of those technical certifications, I guess is what I'm getting at. And, um, and that's a large part of why it's not entry level. Uh, you you cannot you can take the exam whenever you want actually, but you cannot complete certification until you have four to five years of experience, and you need a sponsor. Yeah, you need uh, another CISSP in good standing to to uh, say to the association, yeah, let Kip in. Yep, to vouch for you. Yep. Uh, by the way, lawyers need two. Uh, two <laughs> two sponsors to gain entrance to the bar. It just so. makes me wonder how uh, how closely ISC Square modeled on 
um, you know, legal on the, you know, on the, on the process of becoming a lawyer. It's, I it's would say they definitely parallel. looked, yeah, they, they looked at it for sure. And I think, um, I think that if you look over the, the eight domains is what they call it, uh, you know, you'll see that there's a, there's, it's a wide ranging certification. Oh, yeah. that, that's what makes the exam difficult to prepare for. So the title of this, this episode is, you know, passing your CISSP exam. And so let's, let's maybe move into some of that. So we okay. already know the version I took. Kip, why don't you tell us the version you took? Okay, so you took the version that you described, which is the ad- adaptive exam yeah. sitting and, at a computer and so forth. And it forth. was in 2018, I believe. 2018, okay. <laughs> All right, well, this is, this is where I get to go into full disclosure mode. I sat for my CISSP exam in May of 1997, so Kip. the the credential was only three years old at that time. Kip, I, I have to point out that I was a sophomore in high school in May of 1997. <laughs> oh. I, just, I just want you to know that. I weep for the future. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Anyway, what was I? I was a captain in, in the Air Force. I was on active duty. And Uncle Sam decided that, um, you know, that this was a good thing for me. So Uncle Sam actually generously... And without asking for very much in return, uh, got me ready for the exam by putting me through a, um, a, a prep course and then, um, and then flew me to Dallas, Texas. Actually, each prep course was in a different location around the U.S. So I did one week of prep in like Nashua, New Hampshire, and then I did another week of prep in Dallas, Texas. And then I went back to Dallas, Texas to take the exam. It was totally different than what it is now. So um, I will entertain you by telling you a little bit about how it was different, but it's completely irrelevant. Um Think about if uh, you know a, a big conference room, very large conference room, is about fifty test takers in the room. This is so old school. It was like I was going to take an SAT exam, and um, super formal atmosphere, dead silent room. <laughs> we had number two pencils. We had a little like a pencil sharpener in the back of the room. Everybody brought scantrons to bubble our answers into. There were like roving test proctors, um, and we had six hours. But you had to answer, I mean, you really had to answer every question. I mean, there was no adaptive anything. And so, yeah, that was what I did. Wow, Kip, did you have to uh, fend off any dinosaurs when you were trying to get into the building? <laughs> oh, gosh, you're so, you're just so irreverent. Uh, well, to, to, no. be fair, to be fair, you wrote this script, and <laughs> since you put that in there, I had to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, you really didn't, but... <laughs> oh, no, I did. It's right here. In fact, I didn't say OMG exclamation point. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't have to worry about the dinosaurs because there were armed guards. They took care of them for us. So I, you know, was not burdened with that. I had to pass the exam. Um, but uh, I'm not going to tell you anymore about how I took my exam or anything because it's just not going to help anybody. But you took you took the exam that's that's available now in the in the body uh, common body of knowledge that's currently being uh, yeah. tested. So, what did you do to get ready? So I did a couple of things. Um, the first thing that I did was downloaded the exam outline, which anyone can get on ISC Squared's website. You just go and you can probably just Google CISSP exam outline. And I looked it over and I thought, huh, you know, I know some of this stuff, but I don't know nearly enough. And I thought, but you know what? This would be super helpful. And I thought, that I wanted to get it. So I, uh, at one point, I want to say it was March of 2017, I did a month long boot camp through uh, the local ISSA chapter. Uh, the uh, aforementioned Gene Pollock, uh, hello again, Gene, was uh, one of the instructors. We had a whole bunch of instructors, all from ISSA. And uh, it was a I think it was a relatively inexpensive course. It was like six or seven hours on four Sundays in March. And um, uh, humorously enough, I didn't actually sit for the exam until May of 2018. So over a year and three months later, almost three months later, uh, we can get into why that was. But well, that's uh, an that's that's an evergreen challenge for anybody that's got a working life and a family. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, but I would say that 
you know, the, the, the boot camp course was more of an, it was more of an introduction. There's no way, I don't think you could pass the exam only doing something along those lines. Um, and it wasn't meant for that. Like it, it was really meant to kind of familiarize you with the material so that you could self-study and succeed. And there's a lot of different strategies for doing this. Um, you know, I, I think I probably had a uh, an advantage insofar as, you know, I, I have, I went through law school and then took the bar exam, which by the way, um, interestingly enough, in Virginia, you must wear a suit to sit for the bar exam. Uh, still to this day. Um, now, now I, I can't, I cannot resist telling you that what immediately flashed through my mind was my cousin Vinny and the ridiculous suit. Yes. That Vinny well, wore. <laughs> regardless of what it was, the uh, if you thought your your CISSP test was formal, it has nothing on the Virginia bar exam. Um, <laughs> Here in Washington, uh, you don't have to wear a suit to take the bar exam. It is, however, at three days, um, wow. not six hours. Uh, so, you know, is it computer or paper based? Uh, you bring your own computer. It's essay. Well, actually, when I took it, it was all essay. Um, I think it was what it was eighteen essays over three days, split, split between um, you know the common law and statutory stuff, and then a separate ethics pro- portion. So, uh, but that's the bar exam. Uh, this is not the the modern bar exam is actually more like the modern CISSP, though it is not yet not yet adaptive to my knowledge. Mm. So okay, so, so but you so for your CISSP then just to kind of summarize a little bit, you you kind of brought your expertise and experience of going through law school, sitting for and passing the state bar exam. I mean, you're kind of a professional test taker. Uh, you know, in a way, I think that's that's a fair that's a fair accusation, perhaps, um, <laughs> but. Regardless, you know, the, and we can talk more about this, but the very first thing is, and, and here's the reason that that is relevant is that I know, I know, and I, I knew then, and as I know now, how I learn, right? And that is really the key is it, it's not, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that you should all do what I did because that's not guaranteed to work for anyone but me. Um, I'll tell you what I did, but. Uh, I think Kip, you you had some ideas about. Uh, in fact, you have a three point plan, which I don't want to spoil. But uh, spoiler alert: point one is know <laughs> and play to your test prep strengths. Yeah, and you have to use that. So for me, here's what I did: um, I picked a book. Um, uh, it was the uh, the one that was written by Eric Conrad and uh, and another author. Um, it's. Uh, CISPI, it's oh, I just did it. See, it's Dang. one of the it's yeah, Spank it's one him. of the one of the CISSP <laughs> uh, prep books, uh, and I just read that book. I went through it, and much like I did throughout law school, I I I took my own notes from the book um, as I went, and then I uh, and then I studied what resulted from that. And the reason that's important and that it works for me is that if you just read something and highlight it. You're not really going to. You're not necessarily going to retain it. Whereas if you rewrite it in your own words, you know this is. It's more likely to stick with you. So that's how I did it in a nutshell. You know, even it. It's not that it took me a year and two months to take the exam because I was studying that whole time. You know, full. Here's my full disclosure. Um, by the time I actually scheduled uh, the exam, I, I probably. Did most of my reading and note taking in the in the you know prior six weeks? Oh yeah, um, so that's typical. A lot yeah, of people and, find themselves in that situation. And, and I think you know, and I'm not even sure if it's if there's anything wrong with that. I think that's just kind of how it is. So um, now I will say it does help immensely when you are, you know, if it's your job, then you're going to see things that make it a lot easier to do. I mean, for example, I was already. Uh, Kip and I were already working together. I don't know if we'd started the podcast. I don't think we had, um, but we were already definitely, you know, doing things together. And so I was able to take experience, link it to the material, and and continue from there. And that's why, I, you know, even as a lawyer without without any kind of sysadmin or network administrator experience, I was able to uh, pass and and then get invited in. So. There's um, that was kind of how I did it. So, Kip, how about you uh, take us through the rest of your three point plan? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, I hope I hope that you're going to find that uh, that this three point plan will be useful for whatever you, you know, whatever test you need to uh, take and pass, right? So it's kind of generic in that way. Um, but I got to tell you, I'm, I have in the past helped people get ready for the CISSP. That that kind of boot camp, you know, the month of Sundays uh, approach that you talked about, you know, I've facilitated that before, um, and so I've seen a lot of people uh, really just uh, kind of crash on the rocks because they um, they 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 don't understand uh, how they learn, and so they borrow other people's learning strategies, and uh, and it and it doesn't fit. So. Okay, here you go. Three-point plan. Uh, Jake, you already said the first one. Know and play to your test prep strengths. Number two, use that knowledge to prepare for the exam. And number three, uh, importantly, schedule and take the exam. You'd be amazed at how many people um, just don't really get around to that. Um, their entire uh, you know goal of becoming a CISSP sort of just dis- disintegrates like so many ACDC songs. So, this is a very simple plan, but if, but again, if you're if you're a full time employee and you don't have a lot of time to uh, spare time to study, um, you know it's going to be difficult. If you're not getting employer help with the accountability part of this and with test fees and study material expenses, then it's going to be even even more uh, of a monster. So let's let's just go through this. Okay, do you know how you learn best? That's that's step one. You have to know. And if you don't know, you need then you need to find out. And there's different ways you can find out. You can reflect on, you know, like your experiences in school and what worked and what and what didn't work. You can actually go and um, take a test to find out what your learning styles are. And I'm not going to point you at a specific test. There's so many of them. Um, and, you know, I want to be careful that I don't um, make this episode, uh, any, any more stale, any, any faster than, than they typically do. So, but just know that you've, you've got to know yourself. You've got to know. So what are some of the different learning styles where you might be a very visual person or you might be an auditory learner? Uh, there could be a physical component to learning for you. There's so many, there's probably a dozen different learning styles. And it turns out that many people learn best when they mix learning style. So this is, so I know about my learning style, right? Um, so for, if I was going to take the CISSP again, I would probably listen a lot to a lot of the, of the prep material. I would probably, uh, listen to a podcast or I would, um, put YouTube on and I would listen to YouTube prep videos and I would combine that with something physical. So for me, that means walking, typically walking. So I would go on a long walk, maybe a 45 minute walk or an hour long walk. And I would listen to, um, some kind of audio prep and I would do it alone. I'd put my earbuds in and it would just be me walking and listening. That's so effective for me. It's a great combination. So what do you know about your learning styles? Uh, so for me, I kind of, I kind of gave that, that hint earlier. I, I do, I do best with lectures that I listen to and then, uh, I have to read and then kind of rewrite in my own, my own terms. Okay. Uh, so I have. <clears throat> There's not, a physical thing going on there too, right? The rewriting process. The rewriting the process. Note taking yeah. process. Yep. Is a physical thing. It's kinesthetic, and um, and it, and it and and you know I have that too. Uh, I don't tend to take notes as much anymore these days. But when I was younger, I would take tons of notes. I would never look at any of them, to be honest with you. But I would take them because the process of making the notes with a pen and ink and a piece of paper uh, would would sink these ideas into my brain. And, um, and so that made a ton of sense for me. Yeah. One of the tricks I learned in law school for, uh, law school exams was uh, sometimes they would, the professors would allow you to bring a single page into the exam. And, uh, I rapidly learned the power of, of text boxes on word. And so I would make these incredibly elaborate, uh, one page kind of cheat sheets uh, that were permitted. So I guess they were just sheets, not cheat sheets. And, um, and it, it wasn't so much that, I mean, yes, it was useful to have the piece of paper, but if you were, if you were going to rely on finding stuff on your piece of paper with six point font, uh, you were in trouble. The process of making the sheet was the best studying that I found. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. That's an extremely, extremely good point. Okay, cool. All right, so that's step one. Know your learning style and then create a study plan that plays to the strengths of your 
learning style. Okay, so that's number two is make that study plan. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this briefly. So if you're a visual learner, then you could mind map, right, the material that you're learning. You could use colored highlighters to mark up your study materials, right? And you could actually say, well, red means this, and green means this, and yellow means this. Or you could actually watch CISP prep videos on YouTube, right? So visual, think about visual things that you can do. Um, if you're a talker, because sometimes I like to process out loud. So I would form a study group and I would take turns quizzing each other in the, in the study group. And these days with Zoom, that, that should be pretty easy. Um, but this study plan has to also factor in the reality of your life. So don't get too ambitious. If you can only do an hour a day early in the morning before everybody else gets up or an hour late at night after everybody in your house has gone to sleep, if that's what you can do, then just embrace it and don't get all sulky about the fact that, you know, it's going to take you a year. Took it, Jake, over a year. And so if it takes you over a year, that's all right. That That's what you can do. That's that's what's most important about your study plan. And if you're, um, and if it takes you a year and you're playing to your learning strengths, then that's perfect. You're, you're probably going to do a wonderful job when you uh, actually get to the exam. And um, you didn't mention mind maps, Jake. I know you like mind maps. Don't you use that as a study tool sometimes? Uh, you know, I didn't know about mind maps uh, until more recently. So I did not actually have, I never really used them to study. Um, I probably would these days if I were I know to you use them, them to break down new topics that you I, I certainly do. Um, it, it was just, a, I, I probably would have used them if I had known they existed, um, at least the, the electronic versions. I just, it wasn't on my radar at, at that point. So, um, yeah, yeah, well, and you know, for me, right, with my clay tablets and um, styluses, cuneiform even, writing. That's right. It wasn't even possible. Yeah. Um, but I, my maps are pretty cool. Sometimes I, uh, I don't use them a lot, but uh, sometimes I, I use yeah. them. And and if you've ever thought about a mind map, um, uh, dear listener, <laughs> yeah. give it a try. It's pretty there, cool. There is one other thing you put it as a bonus tip, but I actually think um, it's it's really kind of a core strategy, which is. Um, find practice exams and take them. Uh, take as many as you can. Uh, there actually, and Kip, you would not be aware of this, there actually is an ISC squared CISSP app for iPhone, and it has built-in quizzes and tests broken down in many different ways. So when I would, uh, when I would take the bus uh, to work back when I would go to an office, uh, I would sit oh, there the on the old days. I know, right? <laughs> I would sit there on the bus and I would uh, go through practice tests, little, just little multiple choice exam versions of it, and that was really helpful too. Yeah, gosh, they practically giving these things away like yeah. candy with all these study aids and yeah. tools and stuff. So, yes, that's there, there really is an good. app for passing the CISSP. Go get it. Um, okay, so all right, so you've so again, recap. Step one: know your learning style. Uh, you probably have more than one. Blend them. Two, do that to make a study plan that's reasonable. And then step number three, take the exam. Actually schedule it. Put a line in the sand, plant a flag, whatever your favorite metaphor is. And at some point, just schedule the exam and uh, and then and then do your very, very best to honor that scheduling and don't reschedule and reschedule and reschedule. That's not very helpful. But you're, this is about accountability, all right? You need accountability because um, no one really, right, uh, is going to wag their finger at you and say, oh my gosh, Kip, you haven't gotten your CISSP yet for shame. I mean, that just doesn't normally happen for most people. You've got to make it happen. So if you can get your employer to, um, you know, to sponsor you, that's good accountability. But if you can't, then just schedule the exam and you'll have the same experience Jake had, which isn't the six weeks leading up to the exam date. You will uh, get that fire in your belly and, and you know, you're going to make it happen. So, um, yeah, get well, yourself had, locked and loaded. I had good motivation. My employer, uh, my, the deal I gave with my, I got with my employer was uh, they would pay for the exam if I passed it. So, you know, uh, I think that's uh, that's a fair that's a pretty fair way of doing it. Now I worked for a small small firm, so I don't, wouldn't expect. You know, I know Microsoft pays for exam prep and exam courses and, and the exam all the time for its its employees. But if you have a smaller employer, um, that's you know it's it's a way to float uh, the uh, it's a way to put skin in the game, right? If you if you're paying or if you might pay the seven hundred dollar exam, 
because you failed, then uh, you know you'll you'll at least study. It's not going to guarantee you you pass, but you'll you'll study. Yeah, accountability is really the the you know I, I said point number three is schedule and take the exam, but really it's about accountability, about having somebody else that is going to know whether you did it or not. And, um, and that just makes a big, big difference in these kinds of endeavors. So, okay, there's the three point plan. I hope that helps you. Jake gave you a ton of specifics on how the exam actually works these days. Any other thoughts, Jake? Um, I would just say that, uh, there's a number of books, uh, you, you must get the official, uh, common body of knowledge. I think that that hopefully goes without saying, but I have that yeah. because it's a great reference. Uh, tool, it's a great reference menu. You must get that. And then I, w- I definitely recommend getting one of the distillations that are out there. There's, you know, CISSP for, for dummies from our friend, um, Peter, uh, Peter Gregory, a shout out to Peter. Um, and there is, uh, there's the kind of original, uh, all in one exam prep book, uh, the huge ones. Those are good. Uh, but really, it's you know find one that you that you can read that that kind of fits your style and and then read the whole thing. By the way, just a f- this is my parting comment to you to everybody here. Having a CISSP is a very good thing if if and when you can acquire one. Um, but the common body of knowledge is also super super helpful. Let me tell you a very practical example of this. I recently served as an expert witness in a data breach lawsuit. And I had to write my report and um, and I had to talk about why it was unreasonable that this data breach occurred. And so as I looked at the facts, as, as these documents were presented to me, I needed some kind of a framework to filter these facts through to find out, you know, uh, to look for signs of reasonableness and signs for un- of unreasonableness. And one of the things that I discovered was that this organization there was no evidence that there was a consistent security architectural approach to designing their systems. Well, it turns out that the common body of knowledge does talk about security architectural principles. And so in my report, I referred to them, cited my sources, and that was incredibly helpful. Yeah, very much so. So I don't know if you know, I don't know if you want to become an expert witness or whatever, but, um, but you know, maybe, you're, maybe you're just trying to convince somebody that, that your brand new Framistan system that's going to, you know, generate revenue for your company should have a what's it's and you could go to the common body of knowledge and you could, uh, you know, um, get some help in making your case. Indeed. So there you go. So, uh, let's wrap it up. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jake, for uh, weighing in with your insights. And that wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Today, we gave you a three-point plan to pass your CISSP, not CISP exam. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport, so include your senior decision makers, legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. So if you want to manage cyber as the dynamic business risk it has become, we can help. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.